Okay, welcome everyone. Um, today's uh, session will um, take a closer look at cancer prevention. Um, we have uh, really uh, uh, great speakers. Um, the field of cancer prevention was much easier to define um, a decade ago uh, and uh, pre-cancer also was uh, easier to find a, a decade ago, but because of uh, uh, really cutting-edge work um, by uh, Dr. Hannah Carter and, and Dr. Ludmil Alexandrov and their groups, um, we have a much better understanding of the underlying biology, tumor biology and, uh, and tumor immunology of pre-cancers so that um, it's beginning a new era of uh, what we call interception, understanding uh, the key drivers of the precancer to invasive disease transition, and then uh, identifying targets to intercept um, the, uh, the lesions before they become invasive. And, uh, and you know, in, in the field of cancer, there are two key transitions. There's the invasive disease transition, for a precancer, excuse me, and then there's the um, the cancer to metastases um, uh, uh, transition as well. Those are the two key big ones. We'll talk about the invasive disease transition, which is of course required first. The first speaker is um, Dr. Hannah Carter. She's an associate professor in the Department of Medicine. Um, she uh, trained most recently, got her PhD um, in biomedical engineering, um, working with uh, Bert Vogelstein at, at, uh, and others at Johns Hopkins. She um, started here in 2014 um, and rapidly um, rose to associate professor in 2020. Um, she's won, uh, received a number of awards, uh, inc including uh, the NCI Director's Award for uh, Early Independent um, Investigator in 2013, and has won uh, a number of awards since, including the Mark Foundation Award. Um, she's published very heavily, in fact, um, it, uh, without question, is the global leader uh, in the study of germline determinants of somatic alterations uh, and cancer development and risk. Um, really opened up an area that was very understudied um, until she really started to drive this to be able to look at how um, our germline um, influences the, the development of cancer and somatic alterations. Um, she's published a number of very high impact papers. Um, notably, in, uh, in 2017, she published the role uh, of germline MHC1. Uh, variants um, in uh, in the development of cancer. Uh, that was in 2017 in cell. And then a year later, 2018, she published um, a um, related study, but this time on MHC2 um, in cell in 2018. And, and the work continues um, uh, to drive this field. We'll start with uh, Hannah Carter. The title of her presentation is reviewing genetic factors that contribute to cancer risk. Anna? Great, thank you so much for the kind introduction, Scott, and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to be here today and share some of our research with everyone. We use computational methods to analyze tumor genomes and have recently become interested in understanding how inherited genetics can modify tumor development and believe that this is a fruitful avenue to look for um, novel biological mechanism that we can use to, to think about future development of preventative strategies in cancer. So we live in a really exciting time where advances in DNA sequencing technology have made it possible to obtain the near complete genome sequence for any individual. This positions us to more systematically study how the genome dictates risk for a variety of rare and common genetic diseases, such as Alzheimer's, cardiac disease, hypertension, and cancer. Just with genomic sequence and very large populations of individuals that we know have gotten these diseases, we can look for genetic associations. That is, we look for regions of the genome where genetic variants 
are overrepresented in individuals that have a particular disease. But these types of relationships are associations. They don't necessarily point to causation. Association can be really helpful for identifying individuals at risk of developing disease. But if we really want to turn an eye to prevention, we need to understand the mechanism by which these variants cause the diseases. Our genomes encode a variety of functional molecules, predominantly proteins and RNA species, that interact together to mediate biochemical processes and cre uh, create biological structures. And these are essential for cells to perform their activities. They sense their environment and they respond accordingly. The human body is composed of over 200 different specialized cell types that work together in the form of tissues. In genetics, um, in, in the case of genetic variants, these variants have the potential to modify the number, the abundance, or the function of these molecules, which can impair the ability of specific cell types to perform their normal duties, thus impinging on the function of tissues and resulting in these types of genetic diseases. And so this is more of the resolution at which we'd like to be able to understand the consequences of genetic variants in order to start thinking about how we could prevent disease. Take for an example, a rare disease called Wilson syndrome, a DNA mutation in an important protein called ATP7B makes it impossible for the uh, cells of the liver to secrete copper in the form of bile. Instead, the copper builds up in the liver, causing damage to the liver cells. Uh, since the liver itself is a major filter for the body's blood supply, however, the copper accumulates through traveling through the blood and other cells of the body, and cells that are particularly susceptible, like neurons, um, can be damaged by this. And so Wilson syndrome is associated with severe damage to the liver and ultimately to the brain. However, if you identify that an individual is at risk for this disease, there are drugs that can help remove copper from the body and they can modify their diet to remove copper. We would like to realize advances like this for cancer risk more specifically. So what my lab does is use high performance computation to study the genetic variants in tumor genomes and bring to bear on it our knowledge of the organization of biological systems and how information is passed within these systems and how variants perturb that in order to understand how these genetic variants are changing cellular behaviors and resulting in cancer risk and patient outcomes. So as we're focused on cancer, um, let's talk about cancer as a complex genetic disease. We can divide cancer into two groups of diseases. These cancer syndromes are the minority, um, but they tend to be an early onset form of cancer and over the years have been linked to rare inherited variants that impact the function of a small number of cancer predisposition genes. The vast majority of tumors are later in, um, occur later in life and are considered sporadic cancers and often linked to exposure to mutagens such as cigarette smoking and UV radiation. However, um, further study of these tumors has revealed that there's still considerable evidence that genetic, inherited genetic factors are playing a role in cancer risk in sporadic cancers as well. Namely, we see families where there's an overrepresentation of similar tumors that are not explained by known genetic variants. And if we look at twin studies, we see that if one twin is diagnosed with cancer, the identical twin has a 14% higher risk of also being diagnosed with cancer during their lifetime relative to um, unrelated individuals in the, uh, in the world. So that suggests that genetic factors are significantly impinging also on sporadic cancers. So to continue with the talk, it's important to understand the two types of genetic variation that we see in cancer. The first case, as we were talking about in the cancer syndromes, are germline variants. So these are variants that are in, inherited through what we call germ cells or gametes. So the sperm and the egg, and then they're transmitted to every cell in the developing infant and the adult body. So every cell in the body will have the variant copy of DNA and that can be passed on to the offspring. The other type of somatic variant, that's, uh, genetic variant that's prevalent in cancer is what we call a somatic variant. These are not present in the germline, but can occur at random due to infidelities in DNA replication or exposure to DNA damaging agents, and are only transmitted to any daughter cells of the cell that was originally um, affected. And these are quite prevalent in tumor genomes. 
Tumor sequencing studies in the last two decades have revealed large numbers of somatic mutations inside tumors, and studies of these somatic mutations have supported a model by which mutations are accumulating over time in cancer cell populations, leading to uh, more rapid growth and higher fitness of the cell population over time. And this process by which the first mutation triggers the expansion um, all the way through when you obtain uh, a tumor with metastatic potential that can now colonize um, distant organs in the body uh, can take anywhere from 10 to 40 years. So there's a long period of time over which this is developing where we'd ideally like to be able to intercept it and prevent the, the ultimate um, metastatic disease, which is associated with high levels of morbidity and mortality. In addition, because these mutations are specific to the tumor cell, they're really attractive drug targets that could allow us to potentially kill the tumor cell specifically without damaging other cells in the individual. This observation has been central to realizing precision medicine along with pipelines for DNA sequencing that allow us to detect these types of variants in tumors. So the, the, what's becoming a standard procedure is to obtain DNA from the tumor as well as normal DNA from a patient, sequence both, align to a reference genome and compare the alignments with statistical methods to identify a high confidence list of mutations that are specific to the tumor genome. But this process also allows us to catalog the germline genetic variants in the individual. So in the paradigm of precision medicine, what we'd like to do is use information from the inherited genome to be able to identify those pop individuals in the population who are at high lifetime risk of developing cancer so that we can um, target them for aggressive screening and early detection of disease. And if possible, think about strategies for preventing them from obtain, um, developing tumors. Once an individual develops cancer, we use information about the tumor genome to try to identify vulnerabilities that we can use to treat their cancer. And so we stratify them based on this information according to the best possible treatment regimen. In order to try to identify novel avenues of prevention, um, our lab has started to try to study these two genomes together. The tumor genome develops on the genetic background of the individual, and in most tumor studies, we are cataloging both types of genetic variation. So if we can find ways in which the, the genetic background influences the development of the tumor, that can bring us closer to understanding biological mechanisms that are important for tumor development, and those are the places where we believe that preventative strategies will, uh, will lie. One of the challenges we face is that if you look at the somatic mutations in tumors and the genes that harbor them, no two tumors look exactly the same. Um, most, the most commonly mutated genes in cancer are only mutated in about 30% of tumors. However, we still can recognize a tumor as a tumor because they adopt these shared neoplastic behaviors. They evade various constraints on their prol proliferation, and so they grow much faster than they should. They gain the ability to resist cell death that should result from the mutations accumulating in the genome, allowing for a genome instability and accumulation of mutations, and they avoid immune destruction. And as I talk about some of the work in the lab, I'm going to focus on this last um, category that I described. The fact that all tumors of, um, evolve the ability to avoid destruction by the immune system implicates the immune system as a significant um, source of selective pressure as the tumor is developing on an individual's genetic background. And thus, inter-individual variation in terms of how the host immune system interacts with developing tumors could uh, have Con uh, consequences for risk, lifetime risk of developing tumors. If we can understand specifically how genetic variants influence immune responses to tumors, maybe we can learn something about how we can empower the host immune system to protect themselves against cancer. So um, there's a lot of evidence that the inherited genome influences immune traits in the population with a number of recent um, publications using these large human cohorts that we now have sequencing data for to identify these genetic factors that are correlating with various immune traits and uh, responses to, for example, common viral infections. So we know that the inherited genome does confer inter-individual differences in immune responses, but how do these bear on cancer development? 
So I'm going to tell you about a study performed by a fantastic MD-PhD student from my lab, Megan Apagadala, in collaboration with some of uh, the other excellent uh, um, faculty here at the Morse Cancer Center, Jill Mezeroff and Sylvia Gutkind, and focusing on a data set uh, called the Cancer Genome Atlas, which is this powerful data set developed by the National Cancer Institute in the last couple of decades, um, cataloging the somatic genomes, as well as the germline genomes of over 10,000 tumors. The way we approached this was to first um, characterize the tumor immune microenvironment. I'll describe that more in a second. Um, and then look for genetic factors that were influential in the tumor immune microenvironment across these 10,000 tumors. Then to dissect these various factors that we identified to try to obtain mechanistic understanding um, of how they're contributing to disease, as well as implicate them in cancer risk. So the study began with Megan curating 741 different molecular measurements that are deemed informative about the tumor immune microenvironment. This includes expression of immune genes, estimated level of immune cell infiltrates into um, the tumor microenvironment that can be obtained from um, RNA sequencing data and a couple of um, composite scores that describe um, activity of specific immune signaling pathways. So that gave us a pretty comprehensive um, description of what was going on in the tumor immune microenvironment of individual tumors. We needed to further confine this though to characteristics of the tumor immune microenvironment that would be under genetic control so that we could find germline genetic variants associated with them. And so Megana did a classic uh, st statistical analysis to look at how much of this measurement data was being um, influenced by genetic factors in the, the, across the cancer population represented by the TCGA. And this narrowed down the list of markers that we should focus on to a set of 137 immune markers. So these markers had evidence of genetic control and we could now start to look for the genetic variants that were influencing their levels in the tumors. To identify the specific variants influencing the, the phenotypes or these, um, these measurements, she performed what's called a genome-wide association study that looks for over, uh, genetic markers that are overrepresented at the extremes of the measurements. And she identified 482 different genomic loci that were associated with the 137 uh, molecular characteristics of the tumor immune microenvironment, of which about a quarter had previously been reported of genome-wide association studies of either immune traits or cancer. And this figure on the right is basically showing you the location of the statistical associations and for um, gene markers of the immune microenvironment, showing you whether the association occurred at the same location in the genome as the gene, which is on the diagonal, or the association involved a distant dis um, relationship. So something on a different chromosome was influencing the, the expression level of an immune gene. This gave us a set of genomic regions that we could then focus on and try to investigate. But one of our concerns was that um, Although we were looking at a set of 10,000 tumors and characteristics of the immune microenvironment, there were a lot of overlaps with general immune traits in the population. So we could just have been identifying genetic variants associated with variation in the population at, at large. Um, so we wanted to make sure that the variants we were identifying were important specifically for cancer risk and developing tumors. For this, we turn to a second large data set called the UK Biobank, which has a very large number of individuals genotyped at this point, somewhere around 500,000 individuals, and it's completely independent from the, the data set we used to identify the associations in the first place. And what we did basically was divide individuals in the Biobank into two groups based on whether they had the risk or the um, genetic variant that was influential on these tumor immune microenvironment phenotypes. And our hypothesis was if these were actually germane to um, cancer development, we would see cancer overrepresented in one group relative to the other. That would tell us that the genetic variant was associated with a higher risk for cancer. And indeed, that's what we saw. We saw an overabundance of leukemias, um, melanomas and skin neoplasms, head and neck cancers, as well as neoplasms of the um, digestive organs, 
Uh, and so this gave us pretty strong evidence that some of, at least some of the associations we had found were not just representative generally of immune traits, but were actually contributing to cancer risk. We also wanted to see if we could use information about what the immune system does when it's stimulated in cancer to further understand the relevance of these um, markers to immune responses in tumors. So in immunotherapy, um, we, uh, what we do is we remove barriers to the immune system's recognition of the tumor, and that generally results in pretty strong activation of the immune system against the tumor. We backed our um, tumor immune microenvironment associated genetic variants into several immunotherapy cohorts and looked at whether germline genetic variants influential of the tumor immune microenvironment were associated with immunotherapy responses, so the ability of the host immune system to control the tumor's uh, growth. And this curve on the left here indicates that um, this, these germline variants actually were somewhat predictive of response to immunotherapy. Total random behavior would have been um, with lines tracking this dashed black line, and anything shifted to the left indicates that um, there was some association with immunotherapy response. We could then look at the specific variants that were most associated with immunotherapy response and ask what genes were they associated with. This implicates these as important um, factors that link the, uh, the inherited genome to the host anti-tumor immune response. And just to note that several of the genes that were identified, including the LRB2, layer one, and the LRB4 are currently being considered as um, secondary drug targets to potentiate immunotherapy responses in cancer patients. So this suggested that the, the genes that we're identifying are highly relevant to um, the, the sensitivity of the immune system to a tumor. So um, now what we're doing is working closely with Silvio Gutkind and uh, his graduate student Victoria Wu to try to validate these genes as potentially relevant um, targets for modulating how the immune system interacts with developing tumors. And one of the first things um, we've looked at is which immune cell types specifically these variants seem to be most active in, with um, notably many being active in a class of immune cell called monocytes um, and macrophages, some in natural killer cells, and um, some in T cells. We've noted a pretty strong association with the burden of these variants and a population of immunogenic macrophages called M1 macrophages. That's a novel association that we're investigating. And we're going to use models um, of tumor growth to try to understand how interfering with these genes modifies the growth of tumors in the presence and absence of immunotherapy. Um, we've also begun doing studies of the immune cells infiltrating tumors in mice and have already found some preliminary data that um, not in the blood or in the um, individually, the markers are no different between macrophages in the blood and the tumor. Um, but when we combine markers, we're starting to see a specialized population of macrophages that are uniquely represented in the tumor and not the blood that might be um, contributing in problematic ways to tumor development. So this raises the possibility that if we can somehow intervene to prevent the emergence of these types of immune cells, that maybe we can um, impair tumor growth, maybe prevent tumors. But there's a lot of work left to be done to really um, determine how effective inhibiting these targets is and at what point um, it would need to happen in order to more effectively prevent cancer. So this is really just a, a horizon but we think it's a really um, promising approach for trying to identify new and interesting targets for um, finding, uh, for using the immune system against uh, tumor development. So just to wrap up, um, we studied interactions between the inherited genome and the developing tumor, um, specifically the tumor genome, uh, in the context of selective pressures acting on tumors. And in this case, I talked about looking specifically at the host uh, immune system. And using this approach, we were able to identify a variety of locations in the genome that are influential in how the tumor interacts with the immune microenvironment, that these um, relationships were important for 
uh, the both for cancer risk and response to immunotherapy. Um, and we really hope that we can take advantage of this type of approach to, um, to change how we approach identifying targets for uh, preventative studies and uh, extrapolate it potentially beyond the immune system in the future. So that concludes my talk, but I just want to call out specifically Megan Apagadala, who did all the work that I was just describing, and my uh, wonderful team, as well as my fantastic collaborators at UCSD, including Jill and Silvio. And uh, of course, this wouldn't have been possible without generous funding from places like the N uh, NCI and the Mark Foundation for Cancer Research. So um, that concludes my presentation, and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Hannah. So we'll move to the next um, talk, and and uh, this is um, a beautiful compliment to uh, the last talk, which uh, focused on germline. Um, Dr. Ludmil Alexandrov will focus now on the environment. The, the two major causes are the environment, the germline, and and clearly the interaction. Um, and um, the title of, of his talk is Understanding and Preventing Causes of Environmental Cancer. <laughs> Dr. Alexandrov um, uh, trained uh, at um, the University of Cambridge, where he got his PhD uh, and master's. Um, he's currently, I forgot to mention, not only in the uh, Department of Cellular Molecular Medicine, but also in the Department of Bioengineering here. Um, he uh, also uh, trained at uh, the Sanger uh, United Kingdom. And before coming here uh, was at Los Alamos. Um, Ludmill has um, uh, really um, essentially launched an entirely new field um, of what's called mutational signatures. Um, and this takes the identification of environmental factors to a whole nother level. Um, and I think he'll talk about some of the work that this can help um, elucidate some of the exposures that would only be detected or proven by these signatures, everything from clock-like signatures to aging signatures, UV, and so on. Um, he published uh, this the landmark paper launching this field in Nature in 2013, and then published a very comprehensive uh, set, um, I think it was last year, uh, in Nature. He's um, one of six co-leads on the Mutographs in Cancer Project. This is a $25 million um, UK grand challenge. Um, that's looking at these uh, exposures. And um, I've had the incredible opportunity to work with both of uh, these investigators, Ludmill and, and Hannah, um, and so witness it up front. And, and one of the projects that, um, that Ludmill, I think we'll talk about is uh, the PCGA. Hannah um, discussed uh, what the TCGA is. This is the precancer equivalent, which um, is a global effort that he's uh, leading here. So. Um, with that, and, and um, again, a number of awards, um, Forbes Magazine, the Belfort Prize, Alfred Sloan, the Packard Fellowship, the V Foundation, Abeloff Award, again, um, very highly recognized uh, and uh, high impact work. Ludno? Thank you so much, Scott, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, so Hannah gave you a beautiful introduction of germline risk factors and how the, uh, the genetics of a person can affect the cancer risk and how one can leverage that for preventing cancer. And as Scott mentioned here, I'm going to give the other side of the coin. We're going to focus on environmental mutagens. We're going to try to understand what are the things, the lifestyle choices, the things that are in, in the environment that one can be exposed knowingly or unknowingly that can affect one's risk. And just if you think about it, uh, the, a lot of research has been done with epidemiology, with questionnaires, uh, questionnaires where this information is being collected by patients. But what I'm going to show you here today is a more unbiased machine learning approach where actually we can retrieve that information directly from the cancer patient. And in this presentation, I'm going to tell you three stories of what we have done already. And I'm also going to tell you uh, three stories of what we're doing and what, how we're planning, uh, planning to prevent uh, exposures to environmental carcinogens. So before uh, I start, I want to give you a brief introduction, an introduction of what are somatic mutations, what are mutational signatures, 
And how do these <clears throat> two factors affect human cancer? And actually, Hannah gave a very beautiful uh, figure of somatic variants or somatic mutations. And a somatic mutation is nothing more than a change in the DNA that can happen in any cell in the body. As a matter of fact, every single day, almost every single cell of any, of any one of us gets at least one mutation. And these mutations originate from many different choices. They can be lifestyle, they could be because there is some defects in the cell, but they could also accumulate just because the cell operates normally. The cell can generate energy, the cell needs to divide, and all of these processes may result in actually changing its genetic material. And what we know that is that cancer risk is very, very strongly affected by mutagenesis. The more mutation one has, and one accumulates, the greater the chance one will develop cancer. Uh, and there has always been a poster child example for that, and that poster child example has been tobacco smoking. So if one looks at lung squamous cell carcinoma, and this is just one type of lung cancer, from 105 patients, one of these patients would have never smoked. And usually when you speak with epidemiologists, they wouldn't believe that patient has never smoked. So if tobacco smoking didn't exist, the cancer type lung squamous cell carcinoma would not exist and that, that's a huge mortality. So the question is, can we understand what are these factors? We know for tobacco smoking, we know ultraviolet light, but can we actually go and understand other ones that were unknown that we may be exposed in our daily life? And indeed we can do that through a, a specific machine learning approach that our lab developed and that approach is called mutational signatures. And with this approach, we can actually look at the cancer of a patient and we can apply our AI to be able to say, what are the processes that cause that cancer? We're able to say the, the reason the person got the cancer was because they were exposed to tobacco smoking or because they had a viral infection or because they were consuming specific plant that could be mutagenic. And I'm just going to give you certain illustrative examples with well-known carcinogens. So if, when one thinks about skin cancer, one always, uh, all, almost always assumes that, that it's caused by ultraviolet light. And the reason is the majority of skin, skin cancer we know from epidemiology are caused by UV light exposure. However, if we go and look at these skin cancers, and if we read their molecular code, we're going to see a very, very specific pattern, a very, very specific pattern of mutations. And you can see that uh, read out here. And in this specific case, this specific pattern of mutation is going to be predominantly C2T mutations at very, very specific context. And this is what we uh, call mutational signature. And in fact, this is the mutational signatures of ultraviolet light. The reason we know that is that if we get cell or mouse models and we expose them in experimental system to ultraviolet light, this is exactly what we'll get in these systems. So now we have one example and if we see a cancer with this specific signature, we can actually say, oh, I know what caused the mutation in that cancer, and I know what can be done to prevent that cancer. So I'm going to give you another example, and again, that's lung cancer. And about 80% of all types of lung cancer are caused by tobacco smoking. As I mentioned, lung squamous cell carcinoma is more than 99%, but the other cancer types could be in non-smokers. And again, when we went and looked at the cancers of the smokers, we saw yet another molecular fingerprint, yet another mutation or signature. And in this case, this is the C2A, these blue mutations. So you see a very, very, uh, very different readout. And in fact, we can actually look at people and when we see that uh, uh, mutational uh, signature, we can say, well, the reason these mutations are, have accumulated is because the patient was a smoker. Uh, not only can we actually separate that signature, we can actually use to quantify that. We can go into people uh, um, who smoke cigarettes, who haven't developed cancer, and we can say, well, how does smoking cigarettes affect it? And we can say, well, if a person smokes one pack of cigarettes a day, so that's uh, depending on the country where you are, that will be a heavy to a medium smoker. But if you smoke uh, uh, one pack of cigarettes a day for a year, one would accumulate 150 mutations in every single cell of one's lung, 97 in one's larynx, 39 in the pharynx, 23 in the mouth, 18 in the bladder, 6 in the liver. So just by smoking that, we can actually see how that changes the mutations across the body, and actually it affects the risk for developing cancers in these organs.
Um, I should say we have been uh, through the, throughout the last maybe decade, we have been able to map a number of different mutational signatures across different parts of the world and uh, related to different exposures or to failure of different processes. We have signatures where things in the cell do not go correctly. And this is some examples here. We have things such as failed repair process or generation of this reactive oxygen species just because the cell needs energy. And we have a number of those signatures that are related to the normal or abnormal operation of the cell. We see a lot of these signatures related to treatment. We see a lot of people with secondary cancers. And the reason is, uh, we, in some of those people, we can see that the reason for them getting that secondary cancer is because of the treatment for the primary tumor. And again, we see a number of different environmental exposure. I have listed some of them here. We have hair alkanes, which is these things that you see in plastic bottles, aristolochic acids, where I'm going to tell you some stories, aflatoxin, UV light, tobacco smoking. But there's also very region specific exposure. So, for, for example, uh, if one looks in Iran, there is a very high, uh, very high prevalence for bladder cancer caused by opium consumption. And indeed, we can see the mutagenic forces that opium consumption causes in that specific region. As I said, the way we extract these signatures, the way we identify it is by leveraging state-of-the-art artificial intelligence. And as a matter of fact, we use a lot of the algorithms in pattern recognition and facial recognition to be able to separate this data, uh, to be able to separate these patterns from the uh, genomics data. We both use traditional computing and we've done a number of quantum computing. So sometimes we need to push the, the, the type of computing we need to be able to really separate these signatures. And again, we interact a lot with other fields within our algorithm development in human health, just because they face the similar, similar problems. They need to separate signals from data sets and they do that very commonly in national and global security. And again, we need to separate signals. We need to find patterns in cancer data. We need to find the bad actors, the mutations that cause the cancer, the process that cause the cancer. And again, that's, that's very similar in other fields. So there is a lot of interaction in that algorithm development. So this was my general view of what we, we've been doing, but I want to tell you three stories and each one of these stories is a slide, albeit a, a heavily animated slide. And I want to tell you first the somewhat unexpected story of azotiaprine. And again, azotiaprine, and this is an image of, of, of this drug, and if you have any clinical training, you would know what azotiaprine is. But for, for those of us who haven't, I just want to introduce it to you. Azotiaprine, this is, is one of the most commonly used immunosuppressant drugs. And if you go to the World Health Organization list of essential medicine, you, uh, you see that every health system and every hospital should have it. Depending on where in the world you live, this could be used for transplant surgery, immune suppression for transplant surgery in the developing countries, or for uh, different autoimmune conditions in more of the Western countries. However, if you were to go to the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is part of the World Health Organization, you will see a completely conflicting message. They'll tell you, this is very dangerous. This causes cancer in humans. Uh, people should be very careful. You should never take it. Uh, and again, I should also mention this methodology has been questioned and studies has been, uh, uh, and people have questioned it. And the majority of people who have questioned it are the drug producers. So when we started this study, we wanted to answer the question, how does, uh, how does the, uh, if this drug causes cancer, how does it do it? Does it do mutations? Or maybe it does it just by suppressing the immune system? And essentially what we did is we took this, uh, uh, this compound and we exposed MEFs, which stands for mouse embryonic fibroblasts. So we exposed mouse cells, we grew them, we sequenced them, and we got a very beautiful signal, very clean signal of mutation, of a mutational signature. And the next challenge was to find patients that have gone through either organ transplant or extensive treatment for autoimmune disease and have developed cancer. And indeed that took a bit of time, but we were able to find a, a, a decent sized European cohort. And when we looked at their cancers, we actually could see that signature. As you can see, there is quite a bit of similarity. Again, one on the right side, you see the human cancer. On the left side, you see what you get in mouse experimental models. And in fact, when we looked at these individual patients, every single patient that has taken that drug had mutations uh, attributed to this specific pattern. 
as an, and patients who have taken other immunosuppressive drugs did not have it. Not only that, we were able to actually look and say, well, if you take the drug for a longer period of time, you should get more mutations. And indeed, that's what we found. If you look at the estimated duration of treatment, the number of mutations increases quite linearly. And lastly, we said, okay, so we see that mutations increase, but are these the causative mutations? Are these the mutations that actually cause the cancers? And indeed, in about 66% of the patients, we can say in, these were the mutations that caused the cancer. And that gave us the evidence and the confidence to say this drug is indeed carcinogenic, and indeed it, co it causes cancer by generating mutations in, in patients that have taken it. So that was my first story. My second story focuses on something that we all know, ultraviolet light, but we all associate ultraviolet light with skin cancer. And to our su surprise, when we started studying childhood cancers, all of a sudden we found the presence of this ultraviolet light signature. So these are, again, each bar here is a patient. The height tells you the, 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 the number of mutations and it's colored proportionately to different patterns. And this is a specific subset of childhood cancers, uh, B-cell ALLs, B-cell leukemias. And when we looked at them, we saw this signature, this very much ultraviolet light signature. So this, you see the signature here. And if we look across these patients, you can see the uh, footprint that we saw. And then if you just zoom in on several of those pa patients, we actually can see this footprint very cleanly in them. And again, one can search for a number of different additional evidence to support it. And for everything we can think of, we found it. We were able to confirm it in three additional cohorts from uh, Europe and Canada. Uh, and we only saw it in Caucasian children, which would make sense. And we absolutely have never seen it of any children um, that were not Caucasian. And we saw that it has less mutations than things like skin cancer, but it's still sufficient number of mutations. And not only that, but we were actually able to find an epidemiological study that says, uh, that was able to ad provide additional evidence and say the only risk factor for developing this childhood cancer is ultraviolet light. And again, this allowed us to, to, to say that ultraviolet light actually causes uh, this le leukemias in children. And in fact, now we believe that the B cells during childhood development travel to the upper layers of the skin, they accumulate mutations in Caucasian children, uh, and then uh, they can result not only into skin cancer, but also in actually developing leukemias. And that has led to a various different regulations and changes of, uh, uh, in regards to children and sunscreen. And the last thing I wanna to talk to you about is liver cancer. And again, I'm switching gears here. Uh, and this was uh, uh, what, what you may or may not realize is plants are very, very dangerous things. Uh, some of the most mutagenic compounds that we have found are from plants. And the plants, and the reason is plants defend themselves one way or another. So this beautiful plant that you see on the cover of Science Translational Medicine is the uh, plant from the Aristolochia family and actually happens to be one of the most potent mutagens in the world. So if you consume it, you're going to get a lot of mutations. You're going to get mutations in your liver. You're going to get in your kidney. You're going to get it in your bladder, et cetera, et cetera. In some parts of the world, mostly China and Southeast Asia, it's consumed as part of Chinese traditional medicine. In others, actually, it contaminates the wheat supply. So in Eastern Europe, it gets collected as part of the, the harvest. The combined harvest will collect it and it uh, will go into the bread and cause this disease. So what uh, this study wanted to do is to try to understand what kind of a problem this is. Uh, and you can see the footprint, the molecular fingerprint of that called signature 22. You can see it's very gray. That tells you that it has a lot of T2A mutations. And in the pie charts that are here shown here on the different maps, they tell you whether the samples are AA negative, whether they have this signature or whether they are AA positive, where, whether they do uh, well, negative, whether they don't have it or whether they're positive, whether they do have it. And what you can see here immediately in Europe, and that should be really Western Europe, you don't have it. There is very little of that compound. In North America, and this happens to include only US and Canada in this specific uh, um, a study, uh, you have it at a very, very small percentage. But if you zoom into Mayo Clinic, you see it about 20% of patients have it. But once you go to Asia, you see that about 50% of liver cancers in China are completely overwhelmed by this fingerprint. 
75% of uh, cancers in Taiwan have a very, very high level of it, and about 25% in South Korea and about 30% in general in Southeast Asia. I should say when uh, uh, when one looks uh, when, when we look through the Mayo Clinic uh, records, the majority of the patients were, uh, that had this AA uh, pos- that were AA positive that had this molecular fingerprint were actually affluent either from Asian descent or affluent uh, patients that came from China or Southeast Asia for treatment at the Mayo Clinic. So as you can imagine, eradicating this plan or stopping its consumption can have quite the preventative effect uh, in liver cancer, and we estimate that between 50 and 70 percent of liver cancer can disappear in different countries around the world. So these are the current, pro- the previous project that we've done, the things that we have done using mutational signatures. I just wanted to give you examplars of the things that we're doing at the moment, the way we are pushing cancer prevention and the way we're trying to utilize machine learning to better understand how we can reduce the cancer burden. The first project I want to talk to you about is the, uh, the work we're doing on alcohol consumption. You may or may not realize that alcohol causes at least seven types of cancer, mouth and upper throat, larynx, esophagus, breast in women, liver, and bowel cancer. And we know that from epidemiology, but we wanted to understand the molecular mechanism. And not only that, we wanted to combine some of the, to understand whether there are certain populations that would be more predisposed to get cancer if they drink alcohol. And indeed, some of the emerging results that we uh, we are seeing is that alcohol has very strong mutagenic properties in all the tissue types where you're um, um, where uh, where the tissue is being exposed to alcohol, such as the mouth, larynx, esophagus, liver, and bowel. But actually, in the breast, it acts in a very different way. It acts through hormonal mechanisms. And indeed, we're also seeing that there's certain population that can be much more predisposed to developing cancer. So uh, specific carriers as LDH or ALDH carriers in Asian population can, uh, if they drink, can increase their risk for developing cancer. BRCA carriers in breast cancer, if they drink, can increase their risk. So we are seeing this interaction between the somatic, the lifestyle choices, and the germline. And in fact, we are trying to explore that further with, uh, with Hannah Carter for several projects. The second project I want to tell you is how we try to monitor. So it's it's interesting and it's useful to be able to look at a cancer patient and to say why they got cancer. It's much more much more useful to be able to look at a patient who is healthy and tell them what to do not to get cancer. And indeed, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to push uh, the methodologies, the sequencing technologies, the AI development to be able to look at data from normal, healthy people as part of their regular checkups and be able to say, to be able to monitor them and to be able to say you're accumulating mutations. Now the person will know that they're smoking, but they may not be knowing that they're consuming a plant or that they're living in a building with asbestos or radon or different other exposures. So we, w- we want to be able to monitor people, to inform them in a way to develop a risk predictor factor of how the, their lifestyle and their environment affects um, the chance for them developing cancer. So that's our second project that we're pushing. And our last project, and something that Scott alluded in the introduction, is the Pre-Cancer Genome Atlas project. And there we have taken a different approach. We we have started to look at the very early lesions, things that are not cancer, but are pre-cancer. So these are things that have a great chance of converting into cancer. And we wanted to move from what you see here on the left, this pathology view, where you look at cells to the molecular review, the things that you can rapidly monitor, things about mutational burden, signatures, drivers, immunoediting, et cetera. And we wanted to understand what are the things that make this growth, and every one of us has this growth, such as moles on our skins, polyps here and there, et cetera. What are the changes that make these precancers or these growth to convert into cancer? And can we intercept them? Can we stop that? Whether that's with targeted therapy, whether that's with immune, uh, uh, with immune prevention, whether that's through public policy. And this is a project that uh, uh, we have been trying to develop. And the, the, the main thing was actually collecting these samples. And indeed, we have gathered a, ga- gather a large team, a global team to collect it from different locations around the world. We've been able to collect more than 1,700 samples, uh, which accounts for a lot of data. And in the moment, we're analyzing the da- this data with our approaches 
to be, to be able to answer these questions and to be able to actually create a roadmap saying, these are the places where we can intercept. These are the places where we can stop the conversion from let's say adenoma to adenocarcinoma, from a nevus to a squamous cell carcinoma, uh, to, to, to a melanoma, et cetera. So this, this is the type of things that we're doing and we're hoping to have some very actionable targets. Uh, with that, I wanna thank you for your time and I wanna open it to any questions anyone may have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ledmill. The next talk um, is, uh, is a real pleasure for me to, for me to give. Um, and uh, it involves very strong collaboration uh, in the pre-cancer prevention area with um, Hannah and Ledmill. This slide is you know, talking about the transition from pre-invasive disease um, where this would be uh, the epithelium and you see the basement membrane here. The definition of cancer is when these neoplastic cells in, in solid tumors invade the basement membrane as shown there. I'll show you data that we know that um, various somatic copy numbers can drive the development of cancer. Um, there's a debate uh, about which copy number alterations and the effect of nonspecific copy number alterations, perhaps as surrogates of chromosome instability and the effect of specific loss in certain regions. It's been recognized more recently, um, shown here, that um, precancers can tend to be, uh, in cross-sectional studies, um, more uh, immune hot with uh, increased antigen presentation, MHC1, strong interferon gamma response, and cytotoxic T cells and the K cells uh, using those measures. And cancer is, is known for uh, a while to be immune cold. The question is, what what role do these play in driving the development of cancer? So this is work from uh, uh, two groups, um, a group at the University of Washington, Fred Hutchinson Center, um, looking at, um, in this case, longitudinal cohorts, which are very important for this type of work. It's very difficult to study this transition if you don't have prospective cohorts. And uh, uh, those are very hard to develop. So there's a lot of cross-sectional studies that are, um, can be problematic. But in any case, um, this group is very well known for studies in Barrett's esophagus, which is a precursor to esophageal adenocarcinoma, which is the main uh, esophageal cancer in this country. And um, this is cumulative probability of developing EA or esophageal adeno adenocarcinoma in months uh, time on the horizontal axis. And this, uh, this shows that as you get increasing levels of uh, copy number alteration, so this is aneuploidy, this is nonspecific uh, elevations of copy number alterations. Big debate in the field between the relation of aneuploidy and uh, chromosome instability. They're not synonymous, but they're related. This is a study from Rebecca Fitzgerald, UK, looking again at this uh, longitudinal cohorts. It turns out that there's fairly good ways to you can study this disease prospectively. And in this case, um, they looked at um, non-progressors versus progressors defined as developing, going from the Barrett's esophagus precancer to invasive endocarcinoma. And um, what you see is that the progressors tend to have a higher copy number alteration level than non-progressors. This is some uh, very recent work from, um, from Sanger primarily uh, and, uh, and CRUK and from Sam Jaynes and um, Charles Swanton and others. This is a paper published uh, two years ago um, that looked at uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the lung. So lung squamous carcinoma, these are TCGA abbreviations. This is actually TCGA and uh, carcinoma in situ. So the question here is, um, we know from Bert Vogelstein's work and others that um, genomic events, the accumulation of genomic events drive multi-step carcinogenesis. What we don't know is what's the trigger to go from a high-grade pre-invasive disease and, and no one dies from pre-invasive disease. It has to invade the basic membrane and then it can metastasis. So it's a really important to know what drives high-grade dysplasia or carcinoma site to, to, to uh, lung squamous. And in this circus plot, hard to read with the chromosomes, uh, this is chromosome three, which uh, I'll come back to, which is an, uh, a key site for lung and head and neck. I'll focus on head and neck mostly, but this is important work. And this uh, inner line is the carcinoma in situ. The outer is uh, the lung squamous. 
And the point is, when you look at these all along, you can see that they tend to look the same. That is that on a genomic level, um, there are not major differences between um, uh, carcinoma in situ and lung squamous cancer. But where you do see a change um, is in immune evasion. So tumor and fledging lymph lymphocytes, a measure of, of again, immune hot uh, tumors. And what they found, and this is a really important study just published um, on this set, that the lesions that progressed from carcinoma in situ to invasive cancer had a transition to an immune cold phenotype. Progression here, you see a low till count compared to um, uh, stable or regression. And there are various measures of immune hot and cold. So this is a very important study, one of the first to really show prospectively in any disease that um, immune evasion may be a, a very important trigger for that um, pre-invasive to invasive transition. Another uh, challenge in the field is um, a, what's been called an aneuploid paradox um, that evolved uh, in the late 2000, 2017. Um, and this paradox uh, occurred because um, two really uh, breakthrough papers, one by Teresa Devoli's group at NYU, and this was confirmed by Matt Meyerson at MIT Broad and, and others, that if you look at this is immune signature, so the higher is a measure of immune hot, if you will, and this is melanoma, and here is SCNA, so this is overall copy number, this is a nonspecific marker uh, of aneuploidy, that in several different cancers, the tumors that had high levels of aneuploidy had um, immune cold phenotype compared to those with low. Wasn't in all tumors, you can see here, um, many tumors uh, did not have that pattern, but strikingly, head and neck cancer, and this is a pan-TCGA study, head and neck cancer was um, one of the two strongest signals in, in her study. Uh, here's 10 to the negative 10. That is, in head and neck cancer, a high level of aneuploidy uh, drove a very cold immune cold phenotype. So on the one hand, you had computational studies that suggested and were confirmed that, that copy number alterations, nonspecific ones, drove cytotoxic marker suppression, immune cold. And at the same time, in about 2017, you had studies out of um, Angelica Mons group in cell culture. So it's not, not in human tumors like this study, but it wasn't computational. This was um, experimental systems where they took uh, normal cells, in this case, retinal pigment epithelial cells, and using techniques like microcell transfer, there are a couple of studies like this. This is one of the first they induced aneuploidy artificially in these cells. And when they did that, it triggered an immune response. And, you know, in a way you can say, well, that kind of makes sense because if you trigger um, uh, alterations uh, in copy number, you would think that the immune system would, would, would recognize that in, when uh, injected into mice. So you had this paradox, why is aneuploidy here causing immune cold? and an artificial uh, system like this, uh, immune hot. Now, this has been used as a so-called experimental pre-cancer system, but as I'm sure you can understand, um, using microcell transfer to create aneuploidy uh, in retinal pigment epithelial cells, you know, isn't really the best um, system you would, for human uh, pre-cancer. But in any case, you had this real paradox. And so that was one of the things we wanted to look at. So from here on, I'll talk about you know, our work in, in head and neck cancer. Uh, head and neck cancer, there are two basic types in terms of um, prognosis, treatment, uh, biology, uh, even more important than stage. And that is uh, tumors that are HPV positive or HPV negative. HPV negative head and neck cancers um, is a much larger global burden. It's the seventh most common uh, cause of cancer death uh, in the world. I can talk about HB positive uh, if there are questions later, but we, we focused on this, this pre-cancer to cancer and tried to control for as many variables as we can. So we focused on HPV negative disease. The first report that showed a copy number alteration associated with risk was actually uh, way back in 1996 when I was at MD Anderson, we reported this paper in Nature Medicine um, in oral pre-cancer. And, um, and what we found is that studying loss of heterozygosity at 3P14 or 9P21, which were 
sites that um, seem to be important to head neck cancer, um, those that had lost at one or both of these sites, we looked at them as a group, had a lower cancer-free survival, in other words, a higher cancer re risk than those that had retention, and you're out to uh, 100 months here. Uh, this has been confirmed by a, a number of different groups, um, uh, which I won't go into unless there are questions, but find the same pattern. Now, this was retrospective and so were the others. Um, in 2016, we, um, we analyzed a prospective cohort of uh, 188 patients with oral precancer with a primary endpoint of invasive disease. And those of you who are not familiar with precancer studies, that's a little unusual. Um, it takes a lot of work to be able to follow patients long enough and high enough risk to really look at not development of high-grade disease, but invasive disease, which is really important in the context of this transition, on the invasive disease of transition I'm talking about, which again, appears different than um, multi-step pre-invasive disease. So, um, and as you can see, the results are very similar to, um, to what we reported uh, many years before and other groups. So this was the design of the study. We assessed copy number um, and immune parameters uh, in oral precancer, prospective set of 180 patients. Um, and we looked at the classic sites of risk. We looked at overall copy numbers or aneuploidy and we looked at loss at 3P14, um, 9P21, and 70P13, where P53 is. And we looked at infiltration of uh, CD3, CD8 T cells using uh, multiplex immunofluorescence. We also looked at CD, uh, a general macrophage marker, CD68, almost as a control. Um, we uh, looked at oral or HPV negative cancer. Um, most HPV negative is oral cancer. We looked at um, overall and oral cancer uh, separately. And we looked at basically the same markers, the same sites of chromosome uh, loss and the same immune markers, knowing that the techniques are, uh, are a bit different in precancer due to the small sample size. So what we were trying to do here is take the, the, the study that, that looked at this paradox in two systems artificially in this one and see what it, what it would look like if in fact we had the exact same system HPV negative tumor genesis, the same exact sites of loss and aneuploidy and the same immune cells. And we also uh, had 32 uh, HPV negative cell lines for mechanism. So in the cancers, this is what it looks like um, in terms of frequency. I'm focusing on 3P and 9P. That's really where a lot of work is done. Trey Eidecker, um published a very nice paper um, that we collaborated with in Nature of Genetics with the, actually the first report from the TCGA in head neck cancer, and, um, and again, found the chromosome 3P loss to be a pivotal change. What we found in this study is that 3P loss was you know, the most frequent alteration in HPV negative head and neck cancer. 9P loss is shown here. But when you then look at the chromosome associations with immune score, you find that in fact, the main driver of this is chromosome 9P loss. And I'm happy to go through this. We, we really, this is a major collaboration with Teresa Devoli's group and with Hannah and uh, Ludmill and, and others here, but we have a ton of data to find this. In fact, this was such a surprising finding that um, at the end of 2019, when we were ready to send the paper in, when this signal appeared, we just uh, couldn't let it go and we tried to disprove it, um, looking at different cutoffs and everything and it just became stronger and stronger. It became my main project during COVID. So this is the bottom line in, in terms of the, um, the effects of copy numbers. So uh, in this uh, cartoon, uh, this is uh, pre-cancer here, you know, red for hot, cancer um, blue for cold. What we found is that when we separated out, instead of lumping 3P and 9P together, we looked at them individually, and it turns out in several different ways that 9P loss at 9P21 was the major driver of cancer risk. This is oral cancer-free survival again in months. So this was a surprising finding because until this point, people were really fixated in chromosome 3P, but looking at it as a group with 9P, it turns out that, that the reason that 3P has been shown to be associated in a lot of these studies uh, is when we looked at this computationally, we found 
that um, the association, when 3P loss was found, there was a, a concurrence of 9P loss um, to the level of 10 to the negative 27. So 3P loss, for whatever reason, is highly uh, related to 9P loss. 9P is the, is the functional driver. So again, I'm just showing you uh, bits of data here. In the pre-cancer setting, um, we looked at every different type of copy number loss. We looked at individual, 3P, 9P, 70P, looked overall. In every analysis, in every cutoff, in every immune metric, when you had, um, so here's high aneuploidy, here's 9P loss. In every case, the loss was associated with an increase in T cell infiltrates and, measure, and markers of um, uh, immune hot. In every single case, there was never a case where any alteration of the numerous ones was associated with immune cold. When you uh, look at it this way, comparing in, in multivariate analysis, the strongest driver of immune hot was actually aneuploidy, uh, nonspecific copy number loss. When you um, let me get move this thing. So when you look at cancer, you find the exact opposite. And again, the difference between the study I showed here. This is the same system. These are humans with HPV-related disease, and we're looking at the same sites. And what you find is that in every case, it was profoundly immune cold. The same alterations that were hot in precancer were cold in cancer. Um, we confirmed the uh, overall aneuploidy level. It was significant, but 9P loss was by far the most significant driver of immune cold disease and HPV negative head cancer, um, you can show, uh, and it was independent and more significant than uh, overall copy number, which was also significant. We looked at a lot of metrics, I'm just showing you one. And this was the striking finding that led to um, extensive study to uh, characterize this over, over about a year span. And I uh, looked at this from many measures. I can give you different points. The other thing I just want to mention is, you know, the invasive the disease transition is one we studied, but, you know, the, the cancer to metastases is the other key um, transition. Uh, there's a recent paper from uh, Angelova looking at colorectal cancer. And there's some data that metastases that escape uh, the pro immunogenic response um, find a way to uh, escape the immune system with aneuploidy. And that altogether led to a concept that we uh, coined this term, aneuploid checkpoint, to reflect the concept that the transition from precancer to cancer, um, and shown here, um, requires cells with copy number alterations that are initially recognized and eliminated to um, develop ways to invade the immune system, escape this checkpoint, and become immune cold. This is a, a, a cartoon that Webb Cavani um, uh, did for, for the paper of what we think is going on. So here is normal pre-cancer and cancer. Again, it's a cartoon based on the, a lot of the data. I don't have time to show, but again, we talked about the importance of 9P21 loss. Um, I'll talk about this in a moment. Um, in pre-cancer, you see evidence of focal loss. And in cancer, what you see is an increase in the deletion size from focal 9P to more of the arm um, and uh, evidence of what we think might be an epistatic interaction between uh, 9P21 and P53 on uh, chromosome 17. Um, the data support that here, some of that, this is stage one and two, look at 9P21 by CD8, P53. In stage one and two, early stage, um, the only effect of 9P is seen in P53 mutant tumors. You can see that here. In wild type, you don't see it. Now, in advanced disease, you see this effect across the board, but in early disease, where, you, where the transition occurs, it's really um, driven, uh, accentuated by P53 mutation. So this is what we think is going on. This is a map um, done by Xin Zhao, a real star in, in Teresa Devoli's lab. This is chromosome 9P. Um, and 9P21 is where virtually the entire interferon alpha, type 1 interferon gene cluster is, about 16 genes, CDKN2A to B. You can see that when you extend to 9P24, you start picking up uh, JAK2, which is, a, of course, a pivotal interferon gamma gene. And importantly, for therapy with, with PD1 checkpoint inhibitors, you pick up both PDL1 and PDL2. 
both ligands of PD-1 are right here and, um, and they're knocked out when you lose 9P24. We discovered actually a new region at 9P13 um, that had uh, immune regulatory genes. I'll just comment that um, Charles Swanton published a couple of months ago, a gene that he felt is a, a pivotal immune regulatory gene at 9Q34. So some of us actually think that this isn't by accident. This may be evolutionarily conserved. There may be an advantage to co-localizing immune genes uh, largely in one chromosome. There's no other chromosome that has a density of immune genes like this, knowing of course the importance of the immune system to um, be able to defend viruses and infections. Um, this is what I kind of mentioned, deletions, if you look at precancer here, deletions uh, tend to be larger, I mean smaller. When you look at cancer, you find not only larger deletion sizes, but a much greater frequency of, um, of, of tumor cells that have this alteration, which can be masked when you have a mixture of normal cells. Uh, and this is what I mentioned before. So, you know, we actually looked at some clinical implications here. Um, the implications for prevention are that patients with 9P loss are ex the highest risk patients to develop cancer, but they're also the, the absolute wrong group to treat with PD-1 checkpoint inhibitors, which unfortunately is, what going, is what's going on because they're well tolerated. There are a few high profile trials that are now reevaluating things because we just had a call with NCI about this because you would not expect a PD-1 inhibitor to prevent uh, a precancer lesion with 9P loss from developing cancer. Other checkpoint inhibitors may work. Um, when we looked at cancer, we looked at um, patients treated with PD-1, nivolumab, and uh, pembrolizumab checkpoint inhibitor. And what we found is that those with 9P loss um, did very poorly, all died uh, here, you can see, and those at retention uh, had um, a long-term survival cure rate of about 25%. Um, this is completely predictive. It had no prognostic effect, which is what's been seen with aneuploidy. The uh, non-immune checkpoint inhibitor group, the chemotherapy group, there was no difference between those with 9P loss or not. The p-value and the hazard ratios were close to one and focal loss didn't work. So um, just to go through really quickly what we think might be the mechanism uh, that um, uh, the, the strongest finding we saw in, in, we saw in cell lines and TCGA is that in, for some reason, 9P loss profoundly suppresses the chemokine CXCL910 family, which is a very strong um, family to recruit um, cytotoxic T cells to tumors. Um, we don't know the mechanism because uh, these genes are not on 9P, but some sort of interaction to reduce those. We were interested that uh, in a study that came out a couple um, months before ours, that in head and neck cancer, different than other cancers, the, the strongest predictor of PD-1 inhibitor activity was CXCL9 level, by far the strongest. And uh, it's interesting that the resistant patients we saw, the 9P loss, dramatically suppressed this specific chemokine family. I don't have time to go through that, but we looked at some other um, aspects. So. You know, this is pretty much what uh, I told you that in HPV negative disease, anyway, um, copy numbers associated with immune hot uh, and cold transition during the pre invasive disease transition. Another issue was whether um, it was a non specific effect of aneuploidy or specific chromosome loss. Uh, we found that both played a role, uh, but as I showed you, but 9P was the dominant, and we talked about resistance. So um, clearly, there's a lot of work to be done and mechanism. There's work going on with, with uh, Silvio Gutkind, Ezekron, Ludmill, um, and others and looking at mechanism as well as looking at other diseases that track computationally with, with head and neck cancer, HP negative, like lung squamous. So um, that's, uh, that's it. I went through it pretty quickly. Just wanted to you know, acknowledge the tremendous collaboration, particularly from UCSD. Uh, Hannah and Ludmill were uh, incredibly um, valuable um, uh, co-authors, contributors, given the heavy computational aspects of this. It was uh, amazingly, this is why you love to work at a place like UCSD, when you have aneuploidy and, and loss of energy playing the key roles and we don't understand how it works, to be able to work with Don Cleveland and Webb Cavani to, to, to understand that is, um, is pretty uh, insightful. Uh, Devoldi's group was a, a major collaborator here, and then other investigators. 
And of course, uh, Lead Mill OS Group are continuing the PCGA. So I will stop there and we have time for, um, for questions on any of it. So thank you very much for, for listening. It's um, you know, really exciting to, to see the kind of work going on here and, and particularly the complementary work uh, on the germline and the environment that you heard from, from Hannah and Ludmo. There's a question, um, have you been able to identify the same signatures for you Ludmo? The same signature as tobacco users in people exposed to secondhand um, passive smoking, if you will? Yeah, that, that's actually a great question. Uh, we have a paper with the NCI uh, coming out um, next month or the month after in Nature Genetics is specifically on that question. Can we find the signatures in passive smokers in secondhand smoking? Um, the answer is complicated, uh, but in the majority of cases, we find the signature at very low levels. Uh, there are places where passive smoking, uh, in the United States at very low levels, there are places where passive smoking can be really at high levels, such as Eastern Europe, such as China. Uh, there is some effect of pollution there where we see that signature at higher levels. But in the US, it's at very low levels. Thank you. And there's a question that uh, also looks like it could be yours. Maybe Hannah will have some thoughts. How do we reconcile the hypothesized antioxidant effects of alcohol, specifically red wine, uh, on cardiovascular disease, um, with, uh, which is uh, reported, purported to be protective with this compelling cancer-causing effect that you discussed? Yeah, I... Uh, so the so red, red wine just to, you know, has a compound called resveratrol. It's, it's been around for a while that people think yes. can prevent uh, everything that's bad, heart disease and things like that. And it has been commercialized, right? The, as, as part of the. Of it's based process. on completely observational data. There is no randomized data that I know of, but nonetheless, it makes you feel better when you have some red wine. What, what do you think? Um, well, I think the epidemiological evidence is very, very strong for the detrimental effect in wine. There is a very strong, for example, especially red wine. Uh, and we, uh, women drinking, there is almost a perfect linear correlation between the drinking and the breast cancer. Uh, again, it's so the cancer risk is very well established. I frankly don't know enough for the cardiovascular risk to be able to comment. However, what I can say is we in cancer, we have example of things that can be at the same time protective and adverse. Birth control pills are an example for that where they can be protective for uterine cancer, but adverse for breast cancer. So th there's things that can be double, you know, that they could be double-edged swords, um, but unfortunately I don't know enough about the cardiovascular uh, uh, part here to answer. Is there any germline relation to this, Anna? Oh, um, I mean, I think Ludmilla alluded to there being some germline factors that could increase your risk of developing the, the uh, mutations associated with the alcohol exposure. I guess, Ludmilla, I was curious if you had looked to see if the mutations due to reactive oxygen species were showing um, lower contribution in tumors associated with alcohol, or maybe you might have to look for red wine specifically since not all alcoholic beverages would include the... Yeah, so we, we, we do have annotation for alcohol consumption. Uh, we don't have the level of detail of red wine consumption. As you can imagine, these things become much more inaccurate as you go there. Um, and we haven't looked whether reactive oxygen species have been depleted in these people. We haven't done that, no. Um, yeah. just, just out of interest, because I've been going to these meetings for 100 years, um, some people may say, well, why do you need red wine? Can you get by with grape juice or something? And uh, apparently you need, I, I know everyone's disappointed, you need red wine to get this effect, uh, at least observational. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a question from an anonymous attendee. Um, it's a great question on uh, the experimental aneuploidy paradox. Have single, st single cell studies been done? Um, it's a, a great point and a great question, particularly when we think that, you know, when you ask yourself, okay, there's a totally different interaction between copy number and the immune microenvironment in precancer and cancer, the same copy number. So why is that? Obviously there's a lot of other alterations and things going on in cancer. So it's not the same milieu, but um, you know, we do think that, it, that normal cells can mask this effect of loss 
Um, you know, in, in pre-cancer, whereas in cancer, you have a much greater um, percentage, presumably, of, of cells, neoplastic cells that have the alteration. And single cell studies would, would get at that. Um, so it, it's really an important um, thing. I was actually just talking to Ned Sharpless and H10 projects uh, last week um, about this. Hard to do it in uh, pre-cancer, but whoever this anonymous person is, you can contact me. I'd love to, to talk to you about that because it's really important to do, um, to, very difficult to do uh, in uh, pre-cancer cells, pre-cancer systems, but the technology is to the point where, where that could be looked at. Um, let's see, is there another question? Um, what is this, uh, so this looks like uh, for you, Ludmill, what is the significance of the signature for clinical practice, in particular, uh, treatment based on the signature difference? Also, can you comment on uh, the talc ovarian cancer um, mm -hmm. question that NCI asked you? Yeah, so, so for the treatment, um, there is a number of clinical trials ongoing at the moment where some of these mutational signatures are being used as biomarkers. Uh, there are specific sets of cancer drugs, example, is PARP inhibitors that target the failure of a repair process. They leave a very distinct signature and there is quite a lot of uh, data showing that uh, you can have much larger uh, uh, patient pool that can benefit from that treatment if you tar target based on the signature. And there is a number of those examples. So th there is a number of mutational signatures, especially based on these processes happening inside of the cells that have been utilized for treatment. Uh, and there is a set of signatures that have been shown very clearly to, uh, if you have them, that you have resistance example is uh, Apobec signatures uh, leading to tamoxifen resistance. Um, so, so they are being utilized into clinical practice uh, in a number of places, but for each one, there is uh, specific details. And for the second time, uh, the second question that uh, 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 Scott ma uh, mentioned, uh, mentioned is the, the talc, the, the powder that there has been a number of lawsuits. Uh, and the question came from actually, it did come from the NCI, whether we can actually look and see, is there any evidence from these signatures? Um, and we weren't able to find anything that, to tell us that they do mutations and cause cancers through mutations. Conversely, you may know that there is also uh, some evidence about pesticides, such as the Roundup, where that's the question whether they cause cancers. And there, there is very clear evidence that they do. Um, yeah. And, and just you know, to point out, and thinking at the resveratrol um, talk is that, you know, observational epidemiologic studies find a lot of provocative um, associations that may not be real because of, you know, confounders that can't be controlled for outside of a randomized study. But the power of these mutational signatures uh, is it gives you an, a very objective measure of exposure that can help clarify some of the epidemiologic findings um, if they're confirmed with these kind of signatures. There's a question. Um, uh, uh, thank you for a great series of talks. We are studying uh, glioblastoma, GBM, and was very interested about the precancerous concept. Wonder if you've identified the characteristics of precancerous cells for GBM, uh, and since GBM is known to be cold. Um, yeah, great question. I don't, I slipped through it quickly, but in the Davoli study, GBM was, a, was a, a real strong example where copy number did not influence hot, cold, um, as opposed to head and neck and some of the others. So it's clearly different. Um, but, uh, you know, so that was the question I see that now. So SCNA did not have the same effect in GBM uh, that we saw in head and neck and melanoma that Teresa Davoli saw. There was no effect of copy number in uh, the hot, cold, in high, low in, uh, in, in GBM, different than lung and, and, and head and neck. Um, the issue of precancer um, is a really interesting one because, you know, until... Ludmill and I started this precancer genome atlas. I, I didn't. I wasn't even aware that there was a precancer lesion in, in, uh, in uh, GBM. But um, apparently, there is. These working groups um, and nationally that are part of this. This includes Jeremy Rich and and Rob Cavani and others. There is a, and Scott Vandenberg, who used to be here is at UCSF. There is biologically um, uh, lesions that are pre-invasive and that transform over time even though, so they meet the biologic definition of precancer, 
but in fact, they, they're not, that's not part of what's used in the literature. So we've been kind of going through that. Uh, it's about as much as I know about that. Ludmill, do you have any other thoughts on GBM? Yeah, I think all of the, uh... All of the brain ones are quite difficult of classifying the precancers. We have identified some of these. Um, um, I don't think one for GBM. Uh, I think there's a lot of discussion. What is the proper precursor there? Let's put it this way. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the, the, the really interesting, important aspects about doing this first uh, precancer genome atlas to, to pattern after the TCGA. Um, so I see a question here that the single cell question came from someone who's retired. Uh, it's a postdoc at Salk, but uh, if you ever decide to come out of retirement, I'd love to talk to you about that because it's a really important question. Um, sounds like you have a lot of insight into it. And uh, clearly the technology is so changing so rapidly that it's now applicable to very small biopsies and precancers. Um, that is the last question that I have. You know, this is really exciting work. It's, um, it's changing very rapidly. And so we're looking for collaborators and, you know, uh, the field's pretty, pretty open in the pre-cancer space at the moment. Um, but with the studies that you've heard about, it's starting to become more clear so that um, interventions and prevention could be really more biologically driven. It's been fairly empiric in the past. Um, I know firsthand because I've done a lot of those studies. So um, very exciting time. Thank everyone.